Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Today I'm very happy to introduce you to Paolo Criminelli from the ICTP in Trieste. Um, a little background about Paolo. He did his undergraduate studies and PhD at Scuola Normale Superiore. He also held a postdoc position at Harvard University and now he's a researcher at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. Some of his um, research interests are early cosmology, including inflation, non gaussianity and alternatives to inflation. He was also interested in modifications of gravity, dark energy, and dark energy models, and astroparticle physics. Today, he's presenting about inflation, perturbation theory, and beyond. So thank you, Paolo, for accepting our invitation. And feel free to start your talk when you're ready. Great. So thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I have to say that I'm looking forward to come back to Chile because it was very nice when I visited uh, Valparaiso and, and Santiago. But OK, for the time being, it's, it's like this. Um, so feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, will, I will start with the basic. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I mean, I will start with some uh, long introduction, but feel free to interrupt me whenever. I mean, it doesn't, uh, uh, we don't need to enter into the details of the, of the paper. <clears throat> so the, um, after the long introduction, I will focus on this uh, paper uh, with uh, basically my group in, uh, in Trieste. But me, before getting into, uh, into this, uh, let me go through some introduction, eh? although I know that uh, many in the audience do not need it, but. Um, so we're going to study inflation. And uh, let me remind you that uh, um, inflation is uh, this period of um, uh, accelerated expansion in the, in the early universe. And uh, it, uh, so it may be realized by a very simple uh, uh, model. Uh, so the simplest model that uh, one has in mind uh, is uh, uh, what is called the single field slow roll inflation which basically means that uh, one has a Lagrangian of this kind, gravity, and uh, a, kinet a minimal kinetic term for, for a scalar field, which is the inflaton and the potential. And uh, the idea of inflation is very simple, is that uh, if uh, uh, you are sitting on top of uh, a, a potential, uh, the universe uh, evolves basically like uh, in the presence of a cosmological constant. And of course, this means that it accelerates and we know that acceleration solves uh, the problems that, uh, uh, that the hot Big Bang cosmology has. Of course, it's not exactly cosmological constant. There is a small uh, uh, evolution of the field. So there is a, a kinetic term. And uh, the good things about this is that eventually inflation will uh, end. So this period of acceleration will come to an end and uh, uh, the universe will start uh, after uh, the energy goes into the, the standard model degrees of freedom, it starts uh, the uh, hot big bang phase. So I will not uh, talk about this later, but let me remind you that uh, in order to achieve this, we need a very flat potential. And uh, because we basically want to sit on top of a positive cosmological constant in some, in some sense, so we need uh, these slow roll parameters, actually all slew of these, uh, to be um, uh, much smaller than unity. And this is a non-trivial constraint in a sense that uh, these, uh, con these uh, parameters contain uh, M Planck at numerator. So this means that uh, uh, I mean, the potential must be very, very flat. I will come to this, uh, uh, back to this in, in a second. Eventually for the calculation I'm going to show you, I'm going to neglect uh, the slow roll uh, uh, parameters in a sense, uh, um, in, in the limit in which uh, these parameters are uh, much smaller than unity and they are neglected, you are in the limit in which uh, you can think about inflation as uh, you are in exact the Sitter space, which is the solution of Einstein's equation in the presence of a positive cosmological constant. And you can also take the limit in which the speed of the inflaton is a constant, okay? Because uh, Okay, this will only be an approximation, but the deviation from this will be suppressed by the slow roll parameters. Okay, so um, this is the classical picture of inflation uh, in the sense that I'm solving basically uh, general relativity plus, uh, um, plus uh, uh, the scalar field. I'm solving the classical uh, uh, equations. 
the beauty of inflation lies actually in quantum mechanics, as uh, uh, we know. Um, and in particular, uh, if I turn on uh, quantum mechanics, but uh, I remain uh, in what is called Gaussian limit, Gaussian is a synonym of free fields. Okay, so you know that uh, uh, if, if you have a free field theory, uh, it's, it's a theory in which everything is set uh, by the, uh, the two-point function. So basically the only non-trivial object uh, is the two-point function. And uh, this is the same as, as saying that the statistics uh, of this field is Gaussian because it's, everything is encoded just in the, in the power spectrum. So, uh, so in this limit, I neglect interactions. And uh, so, you, so what is non-trivial? Usually a, a theory without interactions is very boring. Now, in this case, it's not so boring because uh, um, so I'm, I'm uh, parameterizing uh, scalar perturbations uh, with this variable zeta. This one possible choice of gauge. So this variable zeta, it's basically the, you can think about this as uh, uh, the perturbation in uh, uh, the special part of the metric. Um, of course, uh, there are uh, um, so there is this perturbation, which is uh, um, on the diagonal. And then there are also uh, transverse and traceless perturbations, which are tensor modes. And uh, for the time being, so for this talk, I will basically not talk about tensor modes. Of course, we know that uh, they are very important and uh, a lot of experiments are looking for those. Uh, but OK, we, we concentrate on, on scalar perturbations. So coming back to, to this. So the, the theory is boring because it's just a Gaussian uh, set of modes. So each Fourier mode uh, is independent. What is non-trivial is the fact that uh, the universe is evolving. So you see in, in this action, uh, there are a lot of uh, scale factors and the scale factor depends on time. So what happens is that uh, um, if you think about the various uh, Fourier modes uh, of the inflaton, they, they are a bunch of uh, decoupled harmonic oscillators with uh, time dependent coefficients, okay? And, uh, and this time dependence uh, is, is crucial because if you think about uh, um, having an harmonic oscillator and uh, changing uh, the parameters of the, of the potential, for instance, like in this, uh, in this picture, yeah, you can easily understand that uh, starting uh, with a given state, for instance, the vacuum state, then if I'm allowed to change the parameters uh, and I do it, uh, for instance, very quickly, then uh, if you start, uh, in the vacuum state, then the, the, the after this process takes place, uh, the final uh, uh, state of the system will not be the, the, the vacuum of the system. So in particular, if you take an harmonic oscillator like this and you, you deform the potential very quickly, you make it very, very shallow, the wave function has no time to evolve. And you find yourself in a situation in which you have a very shallow potential with a very peaked wave function. And of course, this is not the vacuum. So it's an excited state. And uh, this is what happens for the Fourier modes uh, of the inflaton uh, during inflation. So you're left in a state which is not the vacuum. And uh, this is what we, we basically is, is the, the <clears throat> in, in short, what happens when we say that uh, uh, perturbations, uh, in particular scalar perturbations, uh, are generated uh, during inflation. Now, as I said, uh, everything is encoded uh, in a two-point function because it's a Gaussian theory. Uh, so up to a delta function, which uh, uh, tells me that the uh, momentum is conserved, uh, you have a power spectrum. And uh, this power spectrum, if you do the calculation, goes like one over k cube. This is what uh, in cosmology <laughs> is called a scale invariant spectrum. So I say in cosmology because if you come from another field, uh, you may be a bit uh, you have different uh, uh, words. So in cosmology, scale invariant means exactly going like one over k cube, which means that in a real space, uh, in real space, uh, this uh, um, goes like a log. It's a log of the distance between the points. Okay, so it's a, it's a very long range correlation. Okay, so compared to, if you think about in Minkowski, Minkowski, the correlation goes down like one over x squared. Here it's just a log. So it's something which basically correlates the modes correlates points on very large scales. And this is exactly what we observe when, when we look at the CMB. So we see correlation among uh, spots in the sky, which are very, very uh, separated. And um, okay, then we're left with a number, 
uh, which is the, the, norm the, the normalization of the power spectrum, uh, which is of order 10 to minus nine. And these, uh, you should think about these as basically uh, the temperature fluctuation uh, that we observe uh, in the CMB uh, squared. So it's the typical fluctuation of order 10 to minus five uh, squared is the power spectrum. Okay, so this is the Gaussian uh, textbook uh, calculation. Um, of course, uh, in the last, uh, say, 20 years, uh, there, there was a, an, an enormous uh, activity in trying to understand uh, deviations from Gaussianity, both uh, from an ex experimental point of view and uh, from the theoretical point of view. From the experimental point of view, uh, if you think, especially if you think about the CMB, um, Okay, apart, of course, there are a lot of gory details, but what you're really trying to do is to try to understand whether this map, uh, this map has a Gaussian statistics or not. So if it is a Gaussian statistics, it means that uh, in particular, for instance, that all the three-point function correlators are zero because the only non-trivial object is the two-point function, okay? So basically, I mean, it's, it's a, a bit more sophisticated, but you're really trying to, to do what you do in, uh, in uh, like, uh, okay, the beginning of university, when you try to understand that you have a, a distribution of data and you want to check whether they follow a Gaussian distribution or not. And of course, uh, in order, when you do that, you, you remember the typical error that you do is of order uh, the number of data, one over the square root of a number of data. And, uh, and this works pretty well also for, for, this, uh, for the CMB uh, because um, the signal is quite clean and uh, um, basically we, we can do statistics with uh, all uh, the, the, the pixels that we have in the sky. Um, just to give you a number, in, uh, for Planck, we're talking about uh, something like uh, approximately 10 million pixels. Um, so basically you, you have 10 million data in your uh, map and you can set errors, which are of order one of the square root of these, which is of order well, something like 10 to minus three, maybe a bit better. And, uh, um, and you get numbers uh, of this kind. So I remind you for the people not in, not in the field, that when you see this number, these numbers are always, uh, they have to be multiplied by the RMS fluctuation, which is of order 10 to minus four approximately. So, it's, so when you see this number, you should say, wow, it's pretty Gaussian because uh, they are telling me that uh, um, they don't see anything up to corrections which are of order uh, five, say 10 to minus four or tens, uh, 10, 10 to minus four. So this difference, uh, there, actually this is just an example, but of course, when I see non-Gaussian, I, I mean, I have to parameterize what kind of non-Gaussianity I'm looking at and uh, Okay, depending on which kind of non Gaussianity, so these are two examples, you get different numbers, but okay, the, the logic is, is, is similar. So before going on, let me mention the following that uh, this endeavor is, con is continuing. Uh, so now, nowadays, uh, we are at this uh, transition stage in which uh, uh, Lasky structure are taking the lead in the experimental, uh, um, in the experimental uh, discovery. Because you know the, the, the CMB is coming to, to a statistical end in the sense that uh, okay we, we can still improve by, by a bit, uh, but not uh, by orders of magnitude. So I'm saying that we are in, in the transition because uh, if you look at the number of data that uh, uh, you can play with uh, nowadays uh, or in the near future, for instance, let's look at uh, future near future quote unquote uh, experiments like uh, like Euclid. Um, well, near future in, in quotation, um, there the number of useful modes uh, start uh, becoming uh, larger than, uh, than, uh, than the CMB. And uh, in, indeed, uh, people are quite confident that these numbers will improve. For sure, they are confident about these numbers for the experts. Um, so this number will, will improve by, by probably a factor of a few. Uh, these also, but maybe it will take more time. But anyway, just to say that uh, uh, this uh, um, process is continuing and the new data are coming and uh, these, uh, these limits will, uh, will improve. So this is about the theory. On, sorry, this is about the experiment. On the theory side, uh, on the theory side, you can say, okay, but uh, 
why we don't we did we didn't see any deviation from Gaussianity. So is it okay? Well, for sure it's okay. In a sense, uh, in the uh, simplest model of inflation, uh, this is what you expect. And basically, the logic is quite simple: is that I told you that in order to to get inflation, you need uh, these uh, uh, constraints on uh, the inflaton potential. And uh, you see, I told you that in order to get inflation, you need the uh, small derivatives of the potential, but small derivatives uh, in quantum field theory language means uh, small interactions, that is to say weak coupling. And weak coupling is the same as uh, the theory is practically free. That is to say that the statistics is Gaussian. Okay? So just to, to make uh, a quantitative uh, uh, check, so I, I told you that there are these uh, uh, slow roll uh, uh, parameters. I can be a bit more quantitative uh, talking about the quartic uh, coupling of the inflaton. I, I talk about the quartic coupling of the inflaton, the, the, the fourth derivative, because it's a dimensionless number. In, uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it makes sense to talk about this particular parameter. Well, it turns out that if you, if you do some, some algebra, it, you find that uh, uh, in order to have slow roll, you need the, the quartic coupling to be much smaller than uh, the power spectrum by, by, by some slow roll parameters. So it's much suppressed compared even to 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus 10, which is the power spectrum. So this tells you that uh, slow roll means uh, that uh, the quartic coupling of the inflaton, for instance, must be very, very small. And when I say small, uh, maybe I, you want to compare this uh, with the quartic coupling of the Higgs, which is another scalar that we like. Uh, the, the quartic coupling of the, of the Higgs is of order one, uh, because basically the mass of the Higgs is the, of the same order as the electroweak scale. And uh, I mean, for a quartic potential, you see that lambda is of order unity. Sorry, Paolo. Um, yeah, please. That, that claim is um, for theoretical reasons, or is uh, it, does it come from observations? What, what, what's the... Hmm. This yeah, thanks. Or... Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's very simple. Um, so it comes uh, just uh, uh, so if, if, you, if you go on uh, with these uh, inequalities, um, okay, so usually we, we talk about epsilon and eta because, uh, because they enter in the, in the predictions for the, uh, the tilt of the spectrum. But actually, you, you, can, you can go on with these uh, uh, parameters. For instance, you can say, ah, I want uh, that uh, the variation of eta in uh, one Hubble time, it must be at most of order eta, or even, uh, I mean, usually it's a slow roll suppressed, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, small, even small compared to eta. So this will, will put some bound on the third derivative of the inflaton. And then you can continue again. You can say, okay, this parameter, which is usually called the xi squared, I want also that this parameter in one Hubble time does not vary much. And so you want this to be much smaller than this. And this puts bound on the fourth derivative. Okay. So when, when now you write, uh, you go through this algebra, you find uh, an inequality that has to do with the quartic coupling. And uh, the, I'm not sure if I remember, but uh, it's something like, uh, um, well, yeah, yeah. You get uh, you get an inequality in which on the on the right hand side you have the power spectrum. Yeah, no, no, I, I got it, yeah. I got it. So it's, sorry, it's sorry, just requiring sorry. that uh, you have a slow roll, basically. For... Yeah, it's just a, sorry. I want to go to, to something. Yeah, it's just a, uh, I want to stress there is no theory in a sense. It's just the, the requirement of uh, uh, having a slow roll. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, uh, assuming that for instance you you don't have a small uh, leaps in the potential or things like that. So if everything is smooth and varies slowly compared to Hubble, you get this, uh, this result, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So there's no theoretical uh, uh, requirement or, or uh, it's, it's just a kinematical requirement. Mm -hmm. now, <clears throat> now, okay, this is what happens in the, in the most uh, naive, uh, simple models of inflation, but, but of course, uh, life may not be simple uh, and people, uh, found that there are various ways to have uh, larger uh, non-Gaussianities. For instance, well, let me mention a few. So one is to have uh, uh, multiple fields. Um, for instance, I don't know, uh, models like uh, the curvaton uh, or um, variable decay. So these are all models in which uh, 
uh, basically the, the, the responsible of creating uh, perturbations is not the inflaton, but another field. And in this case, uh, it's quite common. Uh, actually, I think it's, it's very common to get large uh, non-Gaussianities. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so the, the, the experimental uh, bounds put uh, constraints on these models. Another thing that you can do is to talk about uh, derivative interactions. And the reason here is that, uh, of course, uh, this logic uh, works uh, for the potential. But uh, if, uh, on the other end, uh, I, I add to my Lagrangian uh, an operator, for instance, uh, d phi to the fourth. So th this operator uh, does, not, uh, does not change uh, the, the slow roll. Actually, it's an extra source uh, of friction. Uh, so th that does not follow this logic. So, so this kind of interactions uh, for people not in the so it is it are derivative interactions, for instance, similar to the ones uh, of of, uh, of of the of the pion uh, of uh, a pseudo number Gaussian boson, um, and these are not constrained by this logic, so they can be very large and they are constrained by by experiments. Or you can play with other things. For instance, you can play with features. Uh, features, I mean, uh, some uh, as I said, some uh, feature in the potential. Uh, which may be periodic or, uh, or abrupt, and so on and so forth. But there are many, many uh, possibilities. Now, uh, so there are many possibilities, and we are used also to do calculations. Um, I don't want to enter too much into details, but basically there is a well-defined in-in, uh, what is called in-in perturbation theory, which is sort of similar to the calculation that we do when we calculate S-matrix elements in, uh, in um, in, uh, in quantum field theory to, to study scattering of particles. There is a slight difference, uh, which has to do with the fact that, uh, um, that uh, basically, I stress this because uh, it will become re relevant later, that uh, when, I do, when you do this calculation, so when I want to calculate, uh, for instance, I don't know, the three-point function of my scalar perturbation, um, so I, I, I put, uh, again, the, the, um, the evolution, the time evolution operator. But uh, the only input that I have is that in the, in, at the early times, uh, I am in the vacuum. Okay. So this, uh, if you think about this, is slightly different uh, when we do a nest matrix calculation, because in, in that case, usually you, you're basically comparing uh, the in vacuum with the out vacuum. So basically, in Minkowski, you can project on the vacuum also at late times uh, with the proper uh, I epsilon uh, prescription. Here, we don't have uh, this possibility because we only know that the past uh, you are in the vacuum and we are uh, asking about the future. So this uh, basically um, tells me that basically you, you, you just can do this uh, I epsilon prescription in the past. And this is also the reason why here you have uh, an entity ordered um, um, uh, operator, uh, but okay, these are details. Uh, um, the logic is basically the same as, as uh, doing perturbation theory in, in quantum field theory. Now, let me do an example uh, because this would be the model that I'm, I'm going to study uh, later. So, for instance, uh, let's consider uh, um, a, an interaction, uh, one of these derivative interactions that I was describing. For simplicity, if I have time, I will say something. Let me consider an operator which is uh, the time derivative to the fourth. By the way, notice that uh, since uh, I'm, I'm uh, looking at a theory in which uh, Lorentz uh, is spontaneously broken, uh, in the sense there is a time evolution due to the inflaton evolution, uh, it is not a surprise that uh, I have an interaction which apparently breaks Lorentz uh, because, uh, of course, Lorentz is spontaneously broken by the vector. So I'm, I'm allowed to have interactions of this, uh, of this kind. So I have my free theory and I have an interaction. So in, uh, I choose a canonically normalized uh, zeta. So this object uh, has dimension eight. So I normalize it uh, with Hubble. So instead of choosing a, a, a scale, I, I put Hubble at the denominator and lambda is my small parameter. Um, of course, uh, during inflation, everything is of order Hubble. So the typical derivatives uh, are of order Hubble. The typical size uh, of fluctuations is of order Hubble. And then basically you see that uh, if, if I compare this term with this, uh, you see that everything is of order Hubble and the expansion parameter is uh, small lambda. 
Okay, so you can do the calculation, but uh, I mean, just to get an estimate, uh, lambda is uh, the deviation uh, from Gaussianity, is how important uh, this term is uh, compared to the kinetic term. And, uh, and okay, you can do the same for a cubic interaction in the case you have, uh, you have, um, you have those. Now, now you can say, okay, everything is fine. So experimentally, we have uh, bounds, uh, severe bounds uh, on deviations from Gaussianity. I can do calculations, I can do, um, I can treat perturbatively uh, deviations from Gaussianity. So why you want to go beyond perturbation theory? So what is the motivation? It, it seems that uh, there is none. So the reason why in some case uh, it, may, it may be useful to go beyond perturbation theory is that, uh, I mean, it appears uh, looking at this. So, um, so this is uh, schematically, is the probability distribution of my scalar quantity. So this part uh, is the Gaussian approximation. Of course, I'm suppressing all the k-dependence, so it's very schematic here. Then uh, if uh, you have a three-point function, well, uh, you, can, you can easily check that uh, uh, in order to get a three-point function of this kind, you need uh, schematically to modify the uh, probability distribution with a cubic object, okay, something which goes like zeta cube, uh, proportional to this uh, three-point function. And the same for the higher order correlation functions. So now, if uh, you compare the Gaussian uh, case with uh, the perturbation, now you see something which is slightly different because you see that uh, actually uh, the goodness of perturbation theory is given by, for instance, the comparison between these and this which is this. Okay, now for a typical value of zeta, so if I'm interested in a typical value of zeta, well, typical value of zeta is of order uh, the power spectrum to the one half, okay? And this becomes the usual story. It becomes of order FNL times P zeta to the one half, which is exactly what I was telling you is the, is the, the experimental constraints of the normal shine. But if, uh, on the other hand, you're interested in a very unlikely value of zeta, so if, in other words, if I'm interested in the tail of the distribution, then this logic does not work anymore. So in other words, we have a very well-defined uh, setup to study small deviations from Gaussianity for typical fluctuations. But this will break down unavoidably if I go to very, very unlikely uh, value. Okay, this uh, I think you can buy. Um, on the other hand, you, you may also say, well, but why I'm interested in unlikely value of zeta? So in some sense, if it is unlikely, it means that experimentally is not so, so relevant. Well, let me give you one motivation. I think there are more, I mean, I think, uh, one can ask this question purely theoretically, in the sense that I think it's still important to, to know as much as we can about uh, the, um, the initial conditions of the universe, uh, and also asking, uh, for instance, uh, how the wave function uh, decays uh, on the tails uh, is still interesting, even if it's not experimentally measurable. But, but, uh, but leaving aside these, uh, these um, uh, more theoretical argument, there is a, a case in which uh, uh, looking at uh, tails uh, of the distribution is always uh, important, which is the case of primordial black holes. So let me um, remind you how a, a primordial black hole forms. So in practice, uh, um, in, in a perturbed FRW, you, you can imagine that uh, the surfaces of constant, um, of constant energy, they are slightly perturbed. When a perturbation is very large, so there is a huge perturbation um, somewhere in, in the universe, uh, this perturbation, when it comes back in, in the Hubble radius during uh, the, the hot Big Bang evolution, may be so uh, dramatic to form a, a black hole. Okay? These are what are called primordial black holes. So black holes which are formed not by the stellar evolution, but they are formed by uh, by uh, unlikely uh, large fluctuations uh, in the early universe. 
Now, schematically, although the, I mean, there is all uh, uh, many, many details, but schematically, if you want to, to know whether a black hole forms or not, what you're going to do is uh, to, to filter zeta, your, your variable, uh, with the window function. This window function is because if you're interested in a black hole with a given size, uh, well, you need to know perturbations scaled, sorry, smoothed with the typical scale of this size. Okay. Uh, so the window function selects which kind of black holes you're interested in, which size. After you have this filtered field, you're basically going to ask how likely it is for this uh, smoothed field to exceed a certain threshold. And this threshold is of order unity. Of course, uh, okay, one has to enter into details, do simulation and so on and so forth, but uh, you, you, you want to be order one different from uh, FRW. So you need a fluctuation, which is uh, very different from the background and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's of order unity. Now you see that, uh, as I said before, the expansion parameter is FNL times uh, zeta. But now zeta is of order unity. So the expansion parameter is FNL. And uh, two things. Well, first of all, uh, we don't know whether FNL is smaller than unity or not, not even on CMB scales. So we have no clue because the, the bounds are still far from FNL of order unity. Moreover, even uh, in, 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 um, even in, uh, in simple slow roll, um, in order to produce uh, these uh, primordial black holes, you have uh, to boost uh, the power spectrum on short scales. So of course, uh, the, the, the power spectrum on large scales is very small. So it's very, 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 very unlikely to produce a black hole because fluctuations are very small. So if you want to produce a sizable amount of black holes, uh, you need to have a boost of the power spectrum at short scales. Okay? So a typical model will look like, uh, I don't know, for instance, you have a potential that at a certain point becomes flat for a, for a bit. And in this region, black holes are produced because the power spectrum is enhanced. Well, in, when you do this, usually you also tend to break slow roll in the sense that you need to, to vary the potential quite rapidly. So it's typical to get FNL of order unity or, or, or larger. Although I have to say, I didn't do a, a, a thorough study of the literature, but uh, so this I find it's, uh, it's for sure it's a motivation for, for to, to, to go beyond perturbation theory. Okay. So any, any question before, before I explain the, the method? Yeah, can I ask a, a, a question mm -hmm. here? Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, we say that at, at CMB, scales we know that the theory should be gaussian right so so uh, large perturbation should stay highly suppressed uh, but for primordial black holes indeed it is a, a possibility that uh, it gets uh, very enhanced so should i understand that um, uh, the derivative interaction for example uh, suppresses uh, is suppressed at large scales and is enhanced at small is more relevant at small scales and that's why i deform uh, the, the pdf at small scales or do, do you have any understanding uh, of that? Well, uh, yeah, what, what, what I'm saying here is the following, that uh, in order uh, to neglect uh, non-Gaussianities, so in order to use the Gaussian approximation to calculate uh, primordial black hole production, you need to know that FNL is much smaller than unity. Now, this, uh, I don't know it, uh, on CMB scales, because it could be of order a few or, or even 10. Mm -hmm. Moreover, on short scales, uh, since I don't, I don't even, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I don't have any clue. On, on short scales, uh, you have to modify uh, the power spectrum. So, so, it, so let me repeat, what I'm saying is that even on CMB scales, uh, we don't know that the theory is Gaussian enough uh, to have uh, such a small FNL, because we are not there yet. But even if you knew that uh, on short scales, uh, I don't know, because uh, you, you have to play, you have to, to do some model building, you have to enhance uh, the power spectrum. So the potential usually has some feature. So I, it, I have to say this to me, it's, it's, it's like a motivation. We didn't get to the point uh, of applying our method to, to primordial black holes. So I don't have anything but, to say, but I just want to say that uh, it's, uh, it's, 
I mean, it's it's a possibility. It's uh, and uh, we, we we do not we don't know whether um, uh, neglecting yeah. uh, non-Gaussianity is a good approximation. Yes. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you, here you're talking about the, the power spectrum. I was referring to to your deformation of the tail uh, more. So may, maybe it's a bit of trust later. Uh, um, yeah, you will see in in, in um, yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure if I will answer everything, but, uh, but ask me again if. Uh, yeah. um, so I don't want to to be very very long. So let me first of all sell the main idea. So the main idea is is, is simple. I think the implementation not so much, but the idea is just the following. That uh, so of course it's very difficult to do non perturbative calculations. So it's almost impossible. Um, but uh, here we want something simple. So we want to uh, study very unlikely fluctuations. Now, um, what, do, what does it mean unlikely? It means unlikely compared to the typical fluctuations. And the typical fluctuations are uh, due to quantum mechanics. So um, basically, uh, when, I, when I say that something is unlikely, it's the same as saying that uh, H bar is too small to, to generate this event. So it's basically the same, if you think about this, as doing a semi-classical limit in which H bar is sent to zero. So now uh, I think that the thing will become more clear, but I'm advocating to use semi-classical methods to study this, uh, this regime. And uh, I think all the physics can be understood in a simple quantum mechanical um, example. And then uh, I will spare uh, the details uh, when we go to inflation, which are uh, a bit complicated. But let me, let me explain the, the method uh, in this simple example. So imagine uh, that you have, uh, a, in quantum mechanics, uh, you have uh, an harmonic oscillator, which is uh, deformed by this uh, quartic uh, deformation. Now, the typical uh, um, calculations that we do in quantum mechanics in, in the courses uh, is we do perturbation theory in lambda. And I'm using the same notation as before. So lambda to me is the typical um, expansion parameter of standard perturbation theory. So if D is the typical uh, de Broglie wavelength, so the typical, uh, the, the, the typical fluctuation in, in the vacuum uh, in the harmonic oscillator, then if lambda is small, then doing uh, perturbation theory in lambda is nice and, and good as it is uh, in inflation. This will allow, for instance, to calculate, I don't know, the, the, the change in the energy of the, of the ground state or the change in the wave function. But, so this is what we do, but, but in, a, in, in a course, but not always, because imagine that I'm interested in the tail of, the probability distribution, the tail of the wave function, okay? So if I explore the tail very far away, well, of course, at a certain point, uh, X is so large that this cannot be treated as small compared to this. Even if lambda is small, I can go to very large values of X and uh, I cannot uh, do perturbation here in lambda, which is exactly what I was saying in the case of, of inflation. So in particular, let me focus on the ground state wave function. Also because it's the same thing that I'm interested in in inflation. So I'm, I'm interested in the ground state wave function. And let me do a calculation using, uh, uh, again, semi-classical methods. Okay, so, so I can take uh, the transition amplitude between uh, a point Xi to a point Xf. I am in Euclidean time. The advantage of Euclidean time is that at late times, you are dominated by the ground state. So the, I can write this as a sum over the eigenstates, but uh, of course the lowest eigenstate will dominate because, uh, because the others are exponentially suppressed. So this object will be dominated by this. I took xi to be zero, just for simplicity, and I'm looking for the, um, I want to, to, to study this object, okay? So the wave function and as a function of xf. Now I can write this uh, using uh, a functional integral. So is the, the functional integral between zero and xf of, 
I mean, uh, uh, functional integral over all possible trajectories weighted by uh, the, the, the Euclidean action. So the advantage is that uh, now I can do an approximation for small uh, h bar. So you need you have uh, uh, the prefactor, which is the saddle point result. So in the limit in which h bar is very small, you are you are dominated by the saddle of the integral, which is the same as solving uh, the Euclidean equations of motion. Okay. So the, so this object now is not uh, uh, integrated over all trajectories, but it's evaluated. The, on the Euclidean uh, trajectory, which uh, uh, gives uh, the set of this of this integral, and then you are left uh, with uh, um, the functional integral over perturbations around this uh, uh, leading uh, trajectory. Okay, so you have a trajectory uh, which goes from uh, from uh, x equal to zero to x f, uh, and then I study perturbations around this trajectory, but. Uh, the, the functional integral over these uh, trajectories uh, is uh, suppressed by powers of h bar, because uh, I mean this is the the, the, the determinant, and uh, if you rescale the y variable, you see that this object is independent of h bar, while this is of order one over h bar, and uh, these other terms are even more suppressed in powers in, uh, in powers of h bar. So let me be even more concrete in this case. So since everything is simple. So I, I told you that the main calculation is the, 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 the solution of the Euclidean equation of motion. So I am in Euclidean time, which corresponds to changing the sign of the potential, because basically I, I, I change the sign of time. So this, I flip the sign of the kinetic term. So this means that the equations of motion can be found flipping the sign of the potential. So I have an upside down potential like this. And uh, I took xi to be zero and uh, a generic xf. And I also told you that I want to take the limit in which uh, tau f goes to infinity. But then uh, it's pretty clear that the only solution that takes an infinite amount of time to go from here to here is a solution with zero energy. So you want a solution that spend a lot of time here and then goes to XF. If I have a finite energy, the solution will take a, a finite amount of time. So using energy conservation, everything is super simple. So you can write the Euclidean action using uh, putting the energy equal to zero. And what you find, you can rewrite this as an integral over X and you find this result. So this X bar is, uh, is this combination, which is uh, the combination that uh, now I'm not, I'm not assuming that is small. Um, and uh, so at the last step is to put uh, this at the exponent. So I want to do e to the, uh, this object. And uh, the wave function that you find is, uh, uh, is this. Actually, let me skip this, but uh, in this very simple uh, um, example, you can also calculate the determinant, uh, which is the subleading correction is in h bar, but uh, okay, this uh, you can find it in, uh, so I, I leave this aside. So let me focus on the leading term, which is given by this. So notice uh, the advantage. So now this is an expression, which is valid for small lambda, but for, arbitrary value of x. So I can go to x extremely large, okay? Uh, this will always be a good, a good approximation. You see that uh, at very large, uh, x uh, does not decay like uh, x squared, e to the minus x squared, like, like a Gaussian, but it decays with a different power of, of x. Because of course the potential uh, very far away is not uh, at all harmonic, is uh, dominated by the quartic, okay? And, um, and of course, then there is uh, the, uh, the determinant, which gives uh, this, this term. And then there are subleading pieces, uh, which I, I, I would calculate only in calculating, uh, uh, looking at the interactions and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So any question about this? Because so this is the main idea. The rest is an application to inflation, uh, which uh, is uh, difficult and, uh, and not so inspiring, maybe. <clears throat>
Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, how do you determine how small, uh, sorry, how large lambda needs to be in this case? Because uh, uh, that's part of the assumption, I think. Uh, and so it is limited by some... Sorry, how, how small lambda must be? No, how I think how large, right? Because you say this is this is valid for yes, a large lambda, or at least a combination of which yeah, yeah. lambda so, be large. Um, yes. Um, so you, you 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 see, I mean, I think it's uh, it's clear from this expression. What what we're doing here is the following: that uh, so the leading term is uh, of order one over lambda times a function of x bar. And the subleading term is uh, lambda to the zero function of uh, a different function of x bar. Mm -hmm. And there is lambda times another function of x bar and so on and so forth. So this is schematically the, our expansion. So this means that um, if, uh, so x bar is uh, the combination uh, basically uh, lambda uh, x uh, squared. Okay, so uh, now, you see that if x is a typical x, so x is of order d, then you don't gain anything because basically, um, because x bar is of order lambda, then you, you need to expand these functions. And of course, what you find is again, uh, the standard perturbation theory. You gain when this is not small. So when uh, x, for instance, uh, is of order one over the square root of, of, of lambda, because in this case, uh, the x bar is of order unity. And then, uh, okay, then uh, lambda allows you to win in a sense, uh, if, uh, if x bar is of order unity, what we calculated is of order one over lambda and uh, the rest is subleading by powers of lambda, okay? So yeah, so this is, uh, um, so it's a good question because also in our case it would be the same. So I'm not claiming that uh, we are uh, uh, resumming all non-perturbative effects. But uh, we are uh, um, basically resumming uh, everything which is leading uh, if you're interested in a uh, very unlikely value of, of zeta. Of course, uh, if, you, if you are interested in typical values of zeta, this goes back to the standard perturbation theory. So you are resumming, uh, but, uh, it, but uh, yeah, you're not gaining anything here. Sorry, Paolo, I have a question. Yeah. So can you understand that in terms of summing around different saddle points, or do you just have one saddle point there? Mm. So Good. So this is a good question. Now, at the moment, uh, maybe I will say something. So at the moment, I only have one set of point. So in, in, at least in this example, uh, I have one set of point. Um, and uh, you see what is the difference uh, compared to the Gaussian approximation. Here, I have this set of point, but uh, I'm solving it uh, exactly. In, in, in other words, when I solve and I find uh, uh, this particular solution, I'm not treating lambda as uh, small. So I'm solving uh, the nonlinear problem. Okay, in this case, it's just a classical mechanics, but I'm solving it exactly. So I'm solving exactly the classical nonlinearities. And the same will be true in inflation. So I, I, I have one saddle, uh, but I'm calculating the saddle uh, not expanding in perturbations, but exactly, so keeping all nonlinearities. So um, I'm reducing the problem to a classical nonlinear problem. Um, yes. Now, the issue of multiple saddles is very subtle, and uh, I don't want to hide it. In a sense, uh, at a certain point, uh, it, may, it may occur that uh, if you go very far from uh, the Gaussian theory, another saddle will, uh, will emerge. Uh, and I don't know what to, to say about this. So in the example that we are, we are going to study, we didn't see any emergence of other solutions, but I don't have any proof that uh, you may find other saddles uh, um, very far away. So, so I'm basically, if you want, I'm, I'm, I'm also assuming that, um, that, uh, the, the, that uh, yeah, that, 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 that we, I'm, I'm just studying the, the saddle which uh, of course in the Gaussian approximation, there is a well-defined saddle and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm studying this uh, and pushing it to the nonlinear regime, whether there is an, a separate saddle, some other configuration uh, in, uh, in, uh, that dominates the, the functional integral somewhere else, this I don't know, and it's a good, uh, a good question. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't want to, uh, to, to keep you too much. So I will be very brief about this, very schematic. 
Um, so, well, the starting point, if you want, you have to recast everything in this formalism, but uh, some has already been done in the literature, there's nothing new. So, for instance, the Gaussian uh, wave function uh, now uh, during inflation, now we're looking at an object which is the wave function uh, as a function. So, this is the wave function as a function of zeta zero. So, zeta zero is the value of zeta at late times. Okay, which depends only uh, on, on X. Okay. So basically the object that I would like to, to, to know is this uh, psi as a function of zeta zero of X. So this contains all the information that, uh, that, that I want to know because uh, this contains the probability in, par in particular of uh, any configuration of zeta. In the Gaussian approximation, well, first of all, you can always write uh, formally at least uh, this object uh, as a functional integral over all the fields and I start uh, in the bunch Davis vacuum, and uh, at late times I put this configuration. I'm interested in. Of course, this is quite formal because I don't know really how to calculate. But in the Gaussian limit, basically the the settle point approximation becomes exact, and this calculation is very similar to the usual calculation of the two point function because the the settle point of this free in the in the free solution is just uh, very similar to the uh, wave functions that we use uh, in the sitter. So this is, is the saddle. You take uh, the action evaluated on this solution. Um, so since uh, you are uh, on the equations of motion, uh, it, it, it becomes a boundary term, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you evaluate this. Uh, and what you find uh, is, uh, uh, okay, there is this term uh, which is purely imaginary. So it's just a phase that basically tells you that uh, the, the, is the time evolution of the wave function. But if you're interested in the modulus square, you don't care about this. Uh, and the modulus square is, uh, is, uh, is basically something which goes like e to the minus zeta squared times the power spectrum. And the power spectrum is, uh, so it's one over the power spectrum, which is one over k cube. And this is exactly what you find uh, here. Okay, this h squared numeric, maybe some factor of two. Okay, so this is uh, the Gaussian case. Uh, but uh, now, basically, what I'm going to, to, to do is the same thing, uh, but keeping uh, uh, the, the, the no linearities. Okay, let me skip this. This is just a statement that, uh, of course, we know also how to estimate perturbatively in the usual uh, method. Uh, the wave function of the universe is just a, a different way of rewriting uh, the in in uh, perturbation theory. For the people uh, that are close to ADS CFT, it corresponds to, to the Witten diagrams in, uh, in, in ADS CFT. But let me skip this. So uh, here I just want to say the following that I'm, 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 I'm basically, um, from, from the point of view of the perturbation theory, I, I'm selecting. Uh, a, a, a subclass of diagrams uh, because uh, as uh, Gonzalo was asking, so I'm interested in the regime in which zeta zero is large. So you see that uh, with the same number of lambdas, so these two diagrams, for instance, so they, have the, they have one lambda, but, but this has more zeta zero because it's a three level. So it's more zeta on the boundary. Since we are interested in large zeta zero, this uh, dominates compared to this. And the same appears at any order. So you can convince yourself that three-level diagrams are the ones which dominate in the, in, the, in the regime in which zeta is large on the tail. Now, so again, we, are, we, we need to do things at three level, but we want to keep all these diagrams. Okay? And this is the same as what we're doing in quantum mechanics. Okay? So let me tell you the, the recipe and then I'll show you an example. So the recipe is, I want to, to solve, and uh, at late times, uh, I have my uh, configuration, zeta zero of x. For instance, it, it can be a configuration that uh, give rise to a black hole. So I want to estimate what is the probability of this configuration. So this at late times uh, here. At early times, uh, I didn't say this, but uh, I'm uh, doing a rotation in, in Euclidean, uh, like in, uh, in the example in quantum mechanics. So in Euclidean time, the, the, the wave function goes to zero exponentially. So instead of, it, of having an I epsilon prescription, I have a full rotation that makes exponential convergence at early times here. 
Um, now, um, okay, so, so these are the boundary conditions. I solve exactly, in the sense I solve the classical configurations, but without expanding in perturbations. So if I'm able, okay, if the Mathematica or Python is able, I find a configuration with these boundary conditions, which is a solution of the classical Euclidean equation of motion, okay? which is the same as we did in quantum mechanics. Um, once you find the solution, you put it in the action. So you calculate e to the minus s over h bar. And this is the wave function as a function of this uh, configuration. Just to conclude, let me show you, then we can have some questions if you have. So I forget about this, just a motivation, but uh, I focused on a particular example, the one I was describing at the beginning, which the interaction is uh, zeta prime to the fourth. Well, for, because it's the simplest example we could, we could find in which uh, uh, the, the code was working uh, uh, easily. Um, so, so this is the only interaction I have. So the equations of motion are given by this uh, uh, partial differential equation, which is not so easy to, to deal with. So what is nice about this example is that uh, we can gain some intuition that then we can check in the full calculation using an ordinary differential equation. So what is the, I mean, more or less, I mean, I cannot prove this, but uh, well, I, I can show that it eventually it works. But the idea is that since this interaction is interactions among modes with similar wavelength, is some sort of equilateral uh, non-Gaussianities, so it makes some sense instead of having a convolution in uh, of different Fourier modes, since these Fourier modes are all with the same length, the, 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 the ODE in which I, I take just a single Fourier mode, and uh, here, instead of, of having a convolution, I put the same mode three times, uh, should give uh, roughly, uh, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm not getting orders of, my, I mean, I'm not getting the, the factors of order unity, but uh, if I'm interested in, in the tail, how the tail approaches zero, I, I should be able to do it looking at the ODE. So you, you, one can do it. Also the ODE cannot be solved analytically, but uh, uh, there is a way to deal uh, to, with, the, with the various regimes. Um, so the, the parameter, so this is the analog of uh, what it was called X bar before, is the classical nonlinearity. And uh, so as a, as a function of lambda bar, uh, I spare you the, the details, but uh, the idea is that uh, we, we can analytically understand uh, the behavior when you go to very large uh, lambda bar, lambda tilde, sorry. Uh, basically the solution as, as a form which scales uh, with uh, uh, lambda tilde. And uh, um, after we understand this, uh, we are able to uh, to calculate the action. So at the end, you remember, once you have the solution, you put it in the action. And what you get is a scaling of this kind. So for very large zeta on the tail, instead of getting a Gaussian uh, fall off, we get something which is a different power of zeta. What is nice is that, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's not analytic in lambda, it's, uh, it's uh, a fractional power of lambda, which makes clear that it's not a perturbative result. It's a, it's a non-perturbative result in lambda. And to conclude, of course, you have to check things using the full uh, PDE. Um, so let me explain what these plots are. So this is time. So these late times, this is early time. So at early time, you are in, uh, in Bunch Davis. So you are requiring uh, uh, that uh, the solution go to zero exponentially. At, uh, at, uh, at late times, uh, I just uh, choose a profile. So th this is a profile with a certain radial dependence uh, just to simplify life, okay? Um, and then what, what, do I, what do I do? I vary the profile, so I, I, I make it larger. So at, for small profile, I get the Gaussian, uh, the Gaussian approximation is good. If the profile is too high, then at a certain point, the no linearities uh, become important. The solution gets deformed in, in a way which is uh, compatible with the ODE. 
Uh, anyway, so everything seems to work, at least for this particular case. And uh, you, you can reproduce uh, a, a behavior which is compatible with, uh, with, with, with this. Sorry, okay. Paolo, that, that profile that you mentioned, uh, you impose it when? At, at, at late times? Or uh, is, 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 does it come from an initial condition? No, 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 good. So uh, the procedure is, uh, is, is really cumbersome if you want. Um, so you remember in the, in, the, in the quantum mechanical case, you have to do, so I fix XF. So I want to evaluate, for instance, psi as a function of XF. So the logic is that I fix XF and I find a solution. Here is the same thing. So if I'm interested in the wave function for a given configuration, I okay, put perfect. the configuration as a, as a, yeah, it does not, it's, yeah, just to be uh, more, again, again. That's, yeah. it's not yeah. an initial value problem. It's yeah, a boundary yeah. value problem. So I fix uh, uh, zeta zero of X and I want to calculate the action of this configuration yeah. and this will Perfect. give you. Uh, so it's, 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 it's cumbersome in, in a sense that, uh, uh, well, it is what it is, but, uh, but yeah. uh, now there are many things uh, that we don't understand and many things uh, left uh, for the future. So, we can do it for a, a simple, uh, yeah, let, me, let me put it away. So um, if, uh, if you want some understanding, you want to push uh, this nonlinearity to become very large. Because of, of course, uh, unless you are in this, uh, so in order to see something dramatic, you want to, 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 to go in, in the regime in which uh, this interaction becomes very large. Of course, uh, numerically, this is not easy. And uh, uh, we were able to do it for this particular interaction, but. Uh, it seems difficult to do it for a general interaction. Um, we have various directions. We can try to, 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 to go towards uh, really say something about primordial black holes in, in, a, in a very concrete model. Uh, we can try to generalize to that different questions, different interactions, looking at different fields and so on and so forth. As uh, uh, Sebastian was, uh, was stressing, there is the issue of uh, possible existence of other saddles. Okay, this is a very general question that I'm not sure how to address. So in, in, at a certain point, uh, um, I mean, I don't know how to, to, to prove that there is a, 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 a well, what, yeah. So, so it, could, it could be that uh, when you go to very, very, very large values, uh, there is another saddle which is completely different from the Gaussian one. So it's not connected with the, with the Gaussian one. It could be even be complex, okay, complex solutions. So this is, is, is something that uh, is, we are exploring. Um, I don't have much to say, but uh, um, we are trying to at least to understand it in, in a toy model. Um, yeah, another possible connection is uh, the connection, uh, maybe you guys are more expert than me, with uh, the question which is related to um, num large number of legs. So for instance, uh, if you're interested in a correlation function, with many, many uh, zetas. The reason why it may be connected, uh, well, is because, you know, the tail of the distribution is also the place where X to the N gets a lot of contribution. Uh, so we're, we're trying to explore whether this has some relation with, uh, what, with this kind of calculation, but so far it, it's not clear whether there is a connection. Um, so I, I, I stop here, sorry. So I, I, I took too much time. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Paolo, for your great talk. Um, we have some time for questions. So if anyone has one, please go ahead. I see that Spiros has, <laughs> has a question, so go ahead. OK, so thanks a lot for the great talk. So um, do, do you intuitively expect that the uh, uh, this is the generic result. I mean, I understand in order to do some calculation, you had to, to choose an interaction. But would you say that, for example, if you take the EFT of inflation, which has you know any, any possible derivative interaction of theta, that would, uh, for example, I mean, isn't it a statement that, that this nonlinearity deforms uh, you know the, the PDF at large at the tails? Wouldn't that be a, a generic statement? Well, um, so I think it is. So um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, um, any derivative interaction will deform the tail, 
in the sense that uh, the action will be dominated by these additional terms. If uh, uh, right. but you are asking something more details, I think I think you are asking whether I can uh, um, anticipate what a given interaction will do on the tail, and this uh, I'm not able to do it. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm yeah. maybe we're missing something. The point is that, uh, uh, yeah, you, you, I mean, for instance, you can sometimes uh, guess what the solution will do, but then. Uh, then you have to take this, this solution and put it back in the action, and then it becomes, I don't know, okay, maybe, maybe we, did, I mean, at the moment, uh, I'm, I'm not able to guess uh, if you give me an interaction, uh, what uh, it does on yeah. the table. But maybe, maybe I'm missing something, but at the moment, it's just, uh, I guess, of course, it's, yeah, it, it's, I guess it's uh, extremely hard to, to, to see it, but uh, intuitively, I mean, the tail, I don't know, at some point, it can go either up or, or down, right? So, it would be a really cool statement to 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 be able to 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 say something intuitively about the tail because because for example that would would render you know PBH formation kind of um, uh, unavoidable let's say. Uh, okay, no, I, I agree, but uh, at the moment but, uh, I'm not able to say whether it goes in general right. whether it goes up or down for a generic yeah. interaction. Yeah, okay, sorry, I have another question. So when you say the large number of, of, of sorry, uh, large n correlation functions, so do you expect that there will be some factorial enhancement or do you expect that perturbation theory will break for large n, n nine time correlation functions? Or? Yes, okay, I'm, I'm, it's not that I... Or, I mean, um, well, um, so what, what I know and... Uh, this may, may create uh, some connection is that uh, people uh, uh, have explored what happens in quantum field theory for la large number of legs. For instance, recently there were studies for um, in which people were looking at uh, some particular observable, in particular the, the anomalous dimension of uh, uh, operators uh, like phi to the n with large n. And uh, it turns out that, uh, as you say, you, you lose perturbation theory in a sense uh, the you, you have this, uh, this loss of, uh, um, of applicability of uh, perturbation theory, but uh, sometimes you are able to find uh, uh, some other expansion, some other saddle, if you want. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to papers uh, by Ricardo Rattazzi's mm -hmm. group. And in, that, in those cases, uh, you find uh, basically a saddle point uh, and you are able to do something similar to what I was doing. Okay, so standard perturbation theory does not work, but I find another saddle and I can say something. Now, uh, to be honest, uh, my knowledge stops there in the sense I'm, at the moment I'm not, uh, I didn't understand too much what, uh, for instance, Eva Silverstein uh, uh, had been doing uh, in the context of inflation for large number of legs. So I understand that she has some models in which uh, uh, she's able to calculate basically the full uh, PDF, the full wave function, but, uh, but not, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand whether there is a, an understanding of how to deal with the large number of, um, of legs. So, yeah, this is what. Uh, so, it seems yeah, that uh, what we're doing is similar to what uh, some, some, some other groups are doing for, but you know, the, the saddles are different and um, it's not clear. Also, I mean, at least the group of Silverstein, they were using a stochastic inflation to compute the PDF. And here you are not doing that. No, in fact, in fact to be honest, in, in uh, her papers, uh, I see the question, but in, in a sense, uh, so she refers to correlation function with large number of legs. But then uh, what I see is that there are particular models in which uh, I, I'm repeating that you can uh, calculate the full PDF, but uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't understand the, uh, yeah, no, I don't want to add much. In a sense, I don't think there is a, um, much progress in uh, in uh, understanding, even understanding whether there is a problem, whether perturbation theory breaks uh, when uh, you are looking for a correlation function with too many zetas. Um, I'm not even sure what is the question, you know. So in this case, uh, at least uh, the question is particularly well defined. So you want to calculate, for instance, the probability of black holes, blah, blah, blah. blah. There, I'm not sure, in a sense, uh, I'm not sure, are we asking, uh, the probability, okay, it's, I mean, looking for an endpoint function with n going to infinity, it's not really 
close to experiments, right? Uh, so I'm, I mean, I don't know how to take the limit. So here is something potentially measurable, right? At least in principle, I'm not saying that, uh, but there uh, I'm not sure. So when I take this limit, uh, I'm not sure what is measurable. For quantum field theory, it's a bit uh, better when you look at scattering amplitudes because maybe you, you want to, so if you start producing many particles, uh, these uh, will show up in the total cross-section and so on. But here, I'm, I'm not even sure what is the question. But I didn't think too much, so I, I don't have anything smart to say. Um, I see that Gonzalo has a question. Yeah, um, so uh, Paola, at some point you mentioned um, the issue about having different scales in your computation, let's say different case, but you sort of argue that, uh, well, that was not going to be important for the, let's say, getting a rough idea of the profile of the PDF. But I wonder whether one, uh, it is, whether is it possible to have a more refined kind of question about how uh, different modes correlates on the tails. Let's say when you have large amplitudes and then you want to understand how, for example, uh, a, a long mode correlates with uh, short modes, for example, is that you, do you see some, some procedure there, some approach to, to answer those kind of questions? Mm. No, it's a good uh, question. I'm not sure how to. Uh... And I uh, sort of I ask this because the let's say the the usual answer for uh, the, the non Gaussian answer where where you have F, where 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 one introduces FNL, it sort of does two things for you. Like like, like it, it tells you how the the PDF is going to be deformed, but it also it also gives you back. Uh, um, a procedure of correlating long modes and short modes, sort of it gives you. Now here you kind of answer one question, uh, how, how the profile of the PDF is modified, but I, I guess Lambda also, at the same time, it also gives you a correlation between uh, modes of different wavelengths. So, um, and uh, I don't know if one can argue, okay, it's going to be of this sort uh, without doing uh, too many. Uh, so, so just to understand that what you have in mind is that you would like to, um, to see the correlation between long modes and short modes, but you, you instead of doing in perturbation theory, you want to know this correlation non-perturbatively. For example, and uh, so I, I guess I think this this will be kind of important for uh, phenomenology because uh, let's say you you want to study uh, unlikely events, let's say uh, black holes, primordial black holes. Then uh, one, one sort of question you could ask is about how they cluster, for example, and that requires you to know how, uh, um, let's say, different modes correlate. So, so it's I, 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 I sympathize with the question. In fact, I wrote class here, and I, I had this in mind. Uh, yes, I, yeah. To be honest, I we are a bit stuck with the fact that. Uh, we have to resort to to numerics all the time, and that, unfortunately. As, as people, uh, the experts know, I mean, when you have to resort to numerics, uh, uh, everything becomes uh, very cumbersome in the sense that, uh, in, in, in a sense that uh, it seems to me that if you, if you give me a very precise model and question, uh, okay, I may approach numerically, but uh, that's why I didn't do it, anything for yet uh, with, with black holes because, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the short answer is that I don't know how to deal without resorting to, to again, to numerics and, uh, and it would be nice to find something at least qualitatively uh, better. You see, my problem is that this ODE approximation, uh, I mean, I can defend it in this particular model. The reason is that, uh, you know, the sign, for instance, of this interaction is fixed. But imagine that now I look at the interaction with derivatives like the i zeta, the i zeta, something like this uh, squared, then, uh, you know, depending on the, 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 the relative orientation of these modes, uh, this object may even change sign, or if you take different combination. So I'm, in other words, I'm not sure if I can always reduce my understanding to an ODE, and I'm not sure if this can be done. So unfortunately, if I cannot reduce to an ODE, then it's a mess. I mean, it's everything. It. These are excellent questions, but uh, I don't know the answer. Thank you. Yeah. I see that um, Swagat Mishra has a, a question. Uh, ciao, Paolo. 
I have a very simple question. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so we are talking about the tale of the distribution. Mm-hmm. Now, suppose we have non-Gaussianity, but the but it the tail gets sort of deformed quite far. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, if we want to let's say form, let's say we want to form primordial black holes, it may still be possible that uh, we uh, the non-Gaussianities are still low at that point, and we can just boost the power spectrum so that the variance of the distribution is slightly higher, mm-hmm. still being out quite Gaussian up to that point. Okay. That's possible, right? Um yes um so you, you, you so your question basically is uh, are am i sure that uh, every time i have to do a calculation about primordial black holes uh, I, I need to to resort to this method or not yeah no i'm not sure uh the, the, but the, mm, so what you say is, is is completely fine in the sense if i have a distribution with a large variance but the gaussian everything's fine on the other hand uh, I'm a bit hesitant about this because uh, in concrete models, uh, in order to, you, so you, you want to boost the power spectrum, but in a certain window. And uh, by definition, boost something in a certain window means breaking uh, violently scale invariance. Yeah. And usually, I mean, I, I read some paper, I mean, I didn't play too much with the, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure this is the, a, a generic sentence, but in many models, uh, uh, FNL becomes of order unity or larger just because uh, you are boosting and then going back. So you're not uh, just uh, increasing the power spectrum uh, for a wide range of scales. You just want a boost. And this uh, usually seems to me that induce uh, unavoidably uh, longer shines of order unity. But I don't know, maybe it's not a theorem. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, this cannot be done. So you naturally expect that this could happen in general? I expect that it's, it's quite general. In other words, uh, it seems to me that one uh, should should defend uh, if one has a model to produce uh, black holes, uh, mm-hmm. one should uh, at the very least uh, look uh, that FNL uh, remains small because if, if FNL becomes of order unity, for sure non gaussianities are of order unity. And you know, I'm not talking about small effects because uh, they are sitting at the exponent. So the action, uh, when I say that FNL becomes of order unity, means that uh, what is sitting in the exponent uh, is order one different. So, uh, so it's not uh, it's not uh, some prefactor. It's really like uh, Significant. Let me, let me also say this, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, it's these models, they have a lot of free parameters. So it's also true that uh, one may say, okay, maybe the Gaussian approximation is not correct, but I will modify a bit uh, my parameters. So, so I don't know. I mean, just to say that, uh, um, that, that, uh, you know, you may compensate uh, this uh, this difference uh, between Gaussian and non-Gaussian with the parameters. So, I'm, I'm not sure if there is a, a, a. That's why we're talking about the clustering of black holes, things like that. Because I'm not sure if there is a, a striking signature that uh, the Gaussian approximation broke. Okay. Uh, it could be that uh, it just. That, uh, that's what I want to ask. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll think about it. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um. Any more questions? So um, if there are no further questions, I, I think we have a lot, a lot of questions, so that's great. Um, let's thank again, Paolo, and thank you everyone thank for, you. for coming so today. Let me also mention that, uh, so here at STP, so the, the visitor program is open. If uh, people want to visit for extended periods, uh, so it may be simpler extended periods because of uh, the pandemic. Um, yeah, let me know. So there is the the the, web, the 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 form is open on the on the website. But uh, if you if if you're visiting, uh, if you want to visit for extended periods, let me know. And uh, the visitor program is open. And uh, please spread the voice also among uh, colleagues. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for Thank the much, for the Thank announcements. You. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank everyone. you. Ciao, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much.